Hello everyone, Boater here. One of my hobbies, when I want to make something crafty with art that I can do physically rather than video, <laughs> is making things with perler beads. Um, and I enjoy it, it's a fun craft to get into. Uh, and I thought I would make a video on how to do something like this from start to finish. Maybe not like this, this is two layer, but it's something that, you know, you can kind of get to. Now, of course, Boater being Boater, this ended up being a half hour video. The short version is that you take a reference photo, you turn it into a pattern, you prep your boards, you lay the beads, you tape the beads, you poke the holes, you flip the boards, you remove the boards, you iron it, you flip them back again, you remove the tape, you iron it again, and add magnets or clips or whatever you want to do. But the long version is the video that you have in front of you. So, enjoy uh, as we make a parting gift for one of my coworkers based on a little mascot on the front end named Steggy. I'm going to do this really quick because I'm on the clock and it's quiet here on the front end for a moment. But I have in my hand a little Stegosaurus. His name, Patrick, what's his name? Steggy. His name is Steggy. And it's really bright behind us, so it's throwing off the auto exposure. So we're going to do this. Hey, there we go. Cool. So Steggy is kind of like oh, one of the little mascots that we have up here He's on adorable. the front end. He's super adorable. And Patrick here is going to be leaving town in just a few days. Today's Thursday, and it will be Sunday. So um, I have decided literally last minute that I'm going to do a little perler bead version of Steggy here. Uh, so I'm gonna take you guys on that journey and I think we're gonna get a customer, so. Okay, so I've gotten back home. Uh, I've decided that I'm going to make a perler bead or fuse bead Steggy for Patrick. Uh, again, his last day is Sunday, and we're just going to make a little thing. Not going to be as involved as some that I've done, but just a little something uh, for him to take if he so desires, because he is so enamored of Steggy. So I've taken a reference photo over here. I'm going to keep this up on one monitor. And then over here, I have just a paint window where I am going to draw. What I've decided to do is I'm going to start at his head, uh, because we know what proportion his eye is to the rest of his head. Uh, I'm thinking probably four pixels for his eye, probably three black and then one white one just to kind of have a little bit of shine in there. Build his head around that and then we're gonna work our way backward. He's a little pudgy guy so uh, I'm gonna play a little bit with does his belly come all the way down to the ground or do I give it like one pixel worth of clearance uh, while he has his legs there. And uh, yeah, just kind of getting the plates on the, uh, the top uh, on his back and uh, when I'm simplifying and bringing things down here I might lessen the number of plates from the actual reference photo um, but I want to get those three spots in there as well so I'm gonna dig in now you guys have been seeing a time-lapse but I'm gonna go actually create that now and then we'll move on to the next step which is actually working with the beads Okay, now we are in the craft room. We have created our template, uh, our plan for what Steggy is going to look like. I took a little bit of extra time playing around with the plates on the back, trying to get them to look right. I'm working in such a low resolution that sometimes it's hard to get the detail I want out of it. And I do indeed have fewer plates than the actual stuffed plushy Steggy does. Um, I also, like, I just used colors that I thought were good in paint. Uh, although we're going to figure out what colors we're using in a moment here. And then I just put a solid blue behind it just to make the really light tan kind of stand out. But we need to figure out what we'll be using. Uh, so when it comes to colors, I have a lot. This was the first tackle box that we got. And there are three trays. This one has kind of my off purples in here. Um, all uh, labeled by their Perler uh, brand names. Uh, when you're in the U.S., Perler is the brand that you're most likely going... is the, the easiest brand to find for fuse beads. Fuse beads are kind of the generic term. Perler is the brand name that is commonly sold in the United States. Hama uh, is probably the most common overseas, like European, whatever. So, you know, over here we've got periwinkle, blueberry cream, lavender, pastel lavender, which is darker than lavender. Purple, I've got a metallic mix in here. I've got some of my, you know, pinks uh, and browns in here, and a few miscellaneous shades in here. I actually used a lot of kiwi lime when I did, um, uh, when I did ouchie. Uh, but as you might surmise, these are not the main colors that I use. No, not in this hefty boy. 
because this proved to not be enough for all the colors that uh, I wanted to have in the palette. Honk. Blues and white. Mono monochromes, three different shades of gray, black, and the medium to dark greens. You notice that, like, there's smaller sections, smaller sections for all of them, and then big old thing of black. Black and white are used a lot, so, boom. And then my reds to yellows, my warm colors over here. So, uh, I'm going to go through these, figure out what colors I want to use really quick. I'm going to use all of three beads of black and one of white, so I'm just going to grab those now and set those to the side so that I don't need to worry about their trays. Now that I've grabbed those, I don't need these trays at all. Steggy has absolutely no blue in him. He has... He has gray. I'm going to need this tray. I'm going to need this tray for the gray. I'm going to set that to the side over here because that is going to be needed. This one, though, I don't need. Put in the back. Um, I am probably going to end up making him a more saturated color than he is in real life. Simply because I want to have two different shades of this kind of really light brown, light tan that he is. In an ideal world, I think I would use tan right here um, for his main body and then... Well, yeah, I could probably get away with tan and peach, but I'm not sure. It's not going to be butterscotch and peach because I don't have a lot of butterscotch. I might have more over there, but it's also really saturated. And I kind of want to play around with the less saturated palette. So I'm actually going to take just a small pinch handful of tan. And grab a pinch of peach. Just kind of put them next to each other and see how they look next to each other. And I kind of like how that looks. Yeah, so right here I've got uh, tan and peach. Tan, peach. And I think that those two colors are going to look really good for Steggy. Um, and then we're going to have kind of a medium gray. Um, let's see here. We've got dark gray, gray, and light gray. I think we're going to go with light gray just for the, the very light tones that he's got. So knowing that, um, it is time to load up our pens with some color. So there are a few ways that you can actually place these beads down. You can pick them up with your fingers and set them on the pegs. But unless you have really, really skinny fingers, you're going to have a hard time when it comes to filling in large swaths of color. Uh, you can use tweezers. Uh, tweezers are sold that so that you can grab uh, beads one at a time, or actually I've seen people grab two beads at a time for fill. Uh, it's really cool. I don't have tweezers, so I can't demonstrate. One thing we did do at one point was take a paper clip and just kind of bend it into a little L shape about the length of a bead so that you can just kind of go and quickly grab beads, move them around. But the option that I prefer the most, although the paperclip is really good for detail work, uh, is the Perler pen. So to show how to use this, I'm going to grab a scoop of tan right now uh, and kind of show how this works. So we're just going to grab a scoop. That's good for now just to kind of show off how this works. We'll rotate that closed. I've started to use it without closing it before. That's dangerous. And close this too, because you don't want to accidentally bump it and your beads go everywhere. That is going to be a sad time. You're not going to want to bead again for a while after doing that. So now we've got a bunch of beads up in the hopper at the top of the pen. You kind of shake them, and they come on down into the middle over here. And then from there, you push this button over here, and a bead will rotate down and just drop straight into place. I'm trying to do this while watching my phone, but yeah, okay, so let me just shake those into place. And of course, the, the rough thing is that a lot of the time, it's only so good. Um, like, beads will get caught up in the top of the hopper and not actually 
uh, filtered down into the tube. But when you start going, there we go. It's it almost it's almost like drawing. You get a good rhythm down, and you can just draw a line straight across. There we go. It's not feeding right now, so I kind of got to come back up here, shake them till they go back down into there, and then keep drawing. I feel like some beads work better in the pen than others, but anyhow, that is how the pen works because I do get a lot of questions on that. And now it is time to kind of clean up these random beads of color. I'm going to get a couple of uh, pens laid up, but first I'm going to take all these beads off of here. Okay, so you've noticed that I have two of these plates. These plates are 29 by 29, so they give a pretty good sense of the scale of your piece while you're drawing up your template. Uh, again, I'm going to come back to my computer over here, which I forget if I showed you. Mm, boom! My craft room computer over here. When I'm streaming, I use this camera up here as well as the camera over here, and I get some really cool stuff to be able to show, hey look, I'm doing the beads or bean boozled or whatever it happens to be. But for right now, all I'm doing with this is that I'm recording up here for a time lapse that you will see momentarily. Um, and over here, I've got Steggy as a reference. I'm using graphic scale, um, which is actually meant for animation, but it does a really good job of showing a grid, and I'm able to count pixels even in a solid color area. Paint is capable of showing a grid as well, but I just kind of prefer the look of graphic scale at this point. Um, so, uh, with that loaded up over there, I'm going to start uh, in one spot and start with the eyes. Although before I do that, I actually need to take these two plates and tape them together because I'm going to end up flipping them over with things on them and I don't want them to come apart. And to do that, I'm going to take a bit of painter's tape. You can also just use masking tape. It's fine. They're basically the same thing, or at least as far as this is concerned. And just take a nice big chunk of that. I got the thick stuff. This is like two inch, two inch roll of painter's tape uh, and you'll see why I went with such a thick roll after the time lapse. But now we have a much more solid thing of two across. Um, the image with Steggy is 54 pixels wide, 32 pixels tall. That said, he has much more of a margin around him than I usually do. So I'm going to start right about here. Just kind of put his eyes in there because that's about centered for top and bottom. And again, just kind of work my way uh, across the board. Um, 52, 54 pixels wide. Um, I think he's actually more like 45, but that's still too wide for one plate. So we're going to have the spanning two plates. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to shut this camera off. I'm going to turn this camera on. And it is time for a relaxing and or cool time lapse of assembling Steggy. I have two pens, each of which is laid it up, laid it, loaded up with a different color. Uh, I've got peach and tan. I'm going to be reloading these a few times uh, and you'll be able to kind of see that. Um, and when I'm done with laying these down, I'm going to go in, get some of that light gray and do the spines, uh, the plates, and then we'll take it from there. Steggy is all finished. Um, the fill work takes a fair amount of time, but I kind of like it. Um, the, the plates are still a little messy, but I kind of like it. it. It's a good, you know, he's a plushie. And this is also bigger than life size. Um, 
I started with the size of the eyes and kind of worked out from there, and it looks good. I like it, but it's definitely bigger than Steggy actually is in real life. That's fine. So now we are going to move on to the next part. Um, and so you could just iron Steggy as he is right here. Speaking of which, there's ironing involved. I'm going to get this plugged in and warmed up. Totally safe to have these cables just lying on the ground. Get the plastic away from that. We're actually done with all these beads, so let's clear some space. Okay, so we've got our area kind of cleared off here. Sorry about the squeaky chair. And now it's time to prep this. So you could just iron it straight as it is. Take some parchment paper. You can totally reuse sheets of this. It's totally fine. I've got some that happens to fit right over Steggy. Awesome. And you could just do this. And for smaller pieces, that's probably fine. But what that does after a while is that the heat will warp your boards and it's not going to work nearly as well in the long run. So what you should do is transfer it off of the board before you start. And to do that, you take tape and tape over your art and then flip it over. Since you've taped your uh, boards together, it's going to be easy to flip over. There can sometimes still be tears here. If there's going to be tears anywhere, now's the time. Which reminds me, get a picture of your beadwork on the board. In case things go horribly awful, these are also fun to post to Instagram as DIYs. Tape time. I use the two inch wide tape because it means that I have to use fewer strips of it. And we'll just plop that in right like that. Try to lay it down all at once. Don't let it come up on the edges, otherwise it's going to take beads with it and they're going to come out of alignment. And we use our two inch painter's tape and have totally covered Steggy. Now, uh, there are two different ways to a couple, a couple different ways to think about how you're heating beads. One is to make it like pixel art, and that just you keep heat on it until they basically melt down into solid squares. And for that, you're definitely going to need to do the next step. I don't. I like the slightly hollow, rounded look of partially closed beads, but it still doesn't hurt. And that is to poke holes in the tape, one for each and every single bead. To do that, you can use your paper clip and just poke a hole for each bead. But that's stupid. Don't do that. Instead, take another board. This is 29 by 29 little spikes spaced perfectly for your beads. Line it up with a board beneath it and just go with all your body weight. Just pop. And afterwards you can kind of see here that the pegs have gone through all of the holes that we're concerned about. Over there it's not, but because those aren't beads, that's just tape overspill. So we carefully remove the board from the tape. It's going to want to bring the tape with it. Don't let it. Just very carefully work it up from the surface. Camera fell. And you could just do this board by board. I'm going to just kind of do a little bit of a half board offset so that I can drop the pegs in previously punched holes. It just kind of helps to align it further. Looking for that pop until there is no more give and the boards are completely through your holes for your beads. Carefully. Alright, he only needs one more bunch of stabbies and that's right in the face. Love you, Steggy. Now, time to flip. With one board, no drama. With two boards, basically no drama. As you work up to larger amounts of boards, it is going to be harder. In fact, if you're working on a huge piece, you may may want to assemble it in pieces, flip it in pieces, and then iron it together, stitch it together. This is the largest piece I have worked on. I did do it as a single set of boards, but we're talking like 
five or six boards across and at least three boards high. Again, all taped, so when I did it, it was nerve wracking, but it did all move solidly together. You take it, your thumbs underneath the board, your fingers on top, and you just flippy floppy. Take off your tape that is connecting the two boards, and it's time to pull the boards away. The thing is, the tape that made it so easy to flip is now sticking to the boards. Take your paper clip that you have modified into a tool and just slip that under here to separate the tape. Work your way all the way around. You probably won't get all of it, but you want to at least get most of it so that you can lift the boards. And again, you're gonna very carefully do so because if it brings tape with it, you're gonna end up messing up the pattern of your beads, and you'll see that. We can fix that if need be, but we'd rather just do it right the first time. Don't fix it in post. Do it right. right I've got a fair amount of that pulled up. So now I'm going to take one of my two boards, very carefully lift it. There's only a little bit of tape pulling on one end, so I just very carefully kind of move that out. And there we go. One board gone. Do the same with your second board. And we are drama free on lifting everything of Steggy here. I'm going to show you what to do if something gets out of place. Sometimes when you're pulling up boards, some beads near the edge are going to kind of like flip like that. The nice thing is, is that underneath there, there's still the hole that we punched. So you can always just kind of pop that right back up. Now it is time to iron. We have our steggy down here on a bed of painter's tape. And we have parchment paper. We're going to lay the parchment paper totally covering steggy over the top. And now it is time to iron. You're going to take your iron, now totally warmed up. Don't poke it, don't touch it, just trust me, it's warmed up. And not the whole piece at once, but just kind of starting in one spot and working your way across. You're going to almost immediately see your beads starting to close up. Um, the parchment paper will stick to the beads as uh, you heat everything up, the plastic of the beads is actually going to stick to the parchment paper so that you can see pretty easily what has been getting some heat. Um, you'll see very easily the holes closing up of the plastic of the beads. Uh, I slightly overdid that there, but I can kind of show the difference. One benefit to flipping first and then ironing is that you are doing the back of your piece. Now with some pieces, like Steggy here, there isn't really a front and a back, although just because that's the way I took the reference photo, I am going to have him facing towards the right. There's a little bit more room for error with the back. You can also, if you want, close up the back a bit more with that solid square type thing, um, and then leave the front to be more rounded. So now here we've got the plastic melted to the beads. You can see here a couple lighter parts. That's where the plastic isn't quite getting through to the parchment paper. But around the edges, we're seeing that the holes are starting to close up a little bit more just from the heat that I put on them. I'm going to put some more on here. Certainly there's room for those holes to clean up. I do want to get a solid uh, melt on the rest of those beads that haven't quite gotten there yet. But like back here, that's what I like. I don't want to put too much more heat on that. Always with a circular motion so that you're evenly applying heat. The worst thing you could do is just keep your iron in one spot. Unless there's one spot that's just not melting and then you can just kind of take the tip and go Yes. Now, as this cools, it's going to want to curl in on itself. Curly. It will always curl towards the uh, side that you have just heated. So what you need to do is put some pressure on that. That's why I've got things like video game art books and RPG books. Just kind of take it and flop. Pressure. It will, depending on the size of your piece, it can take anywhere from a couple minutes to a half hour to really cool down. Uh, and for me, it's about bedtime. The longer you let it cool, the more straight it is going to come up, the better it's going to be, the more rigid it's going to be when you flip it. Which isn't a bad thing because pretty soon we're going to be taking off the tape. That said, uh, I think it's time for me to go to bed. So I'm going to let that sit overnight. I will come back tomorrow, iron the other side, and we'll put the finishing touches on Steggy. Okay, it's the next morning, and it certainly had all night to, to cool off and to stay flat. So, we pull this off, and we take a look at 
Steggy. Steggy's looking pretty good. He's solid now. I can pick him up. I can do this. Um, and just inspect your work. Make sure that there are no beads that aren't touching anything because if there are, when you pull up this tape, it's going to bring beads with it. So now's the time to go over do any kind of last spot welding. Uh, but everything here is looking pretty good. So we're going to flip him over. Carefully peel the tape off. Again, it's only fused on one side, so you don't have a whole lot of structural rigidity on this yet. Though again, if you kind of overheat the back uh, more than you intend the front to be, then uh, it's, it is going to be a little more rigid. The downside to the semi-closed uh, pattern that I prefer means it doesn't have quite as much strength as if you're going for a full burn square pixel kind of look. But we've got Steggy. And now, just exactly what we did with the back, we do with the front. Cover them up with the parchment paper, and starting on one end, with circular motion, and without the paper being going separate from him. Once you get a little bit going, and uh, you've started to melt the beads, again, it sticks to the paper, and it's a little easier to manage, but at first your paper's going to slide around a little bit. Especially, like, on the, on the other side, we had some tape that was kind of hitting the paper a little bit, kind of getting it a little bit started. I'm going through just a little bit just to get uh, beads sticking to the paper all the way across and then I'm going to come back and actually kind of close it up to the extent that I would like. Definitely getting more heating on one side than the other. You can to some extent tilt your iron to get uh, proper, you know, just, just to kind of direct where your heat is hitting. Uh, I am taking the tip and just kind of hitting a spot that is between two areas, so it wouldn't quite be hit by that. Just trying to get a little bit more melting in one area, just by using the, the tip of the iron. And I'm going to call that good. So, once again, take your weight, drop it on top, and let it sit for a while. Um, this is actually the more important time to let it sit for a longer amount of time. Uh, if you do that first heat, let it wait for 10 minutes, then flip it over and do it again, wait at least an hour because it is going to want to curl. You want to keep it flat because we are probably done with heating now. We aren't going to get a chance to come back and uncurl it unless, again, you come back to that Castle Crashers piece that was uh, eventually I'm going to hit that on the back just a little bit just to try to flatten it out and take every single RPG source book in my house and just tsh, keep it there for like two days. Uh, but for something the size of Steggy, you're probably fine after an hour. That said, I need to run to work, so I will be back tonight to put the finishing touches on Steggy. Okay, so we're back. It is the evening. I still have a squeaky chair, and we have Steggy, who has now cooled on both sides. So as we take a look at him, he is looking fantastic, good sir. It's kind of a reversible design. He can face either way. I designed him facing that way, and that's what we're going to do. Um, and, like, if you just have him like this, um, what I will do with some things, like up here, is that I will put it to the wall just by taking some little finishing nails, putting them through the holes, just straight into the drywall. That's how I've hung a few things. And that's probably what I'm going to do with hanging up the Castle Crashers piece, again, once I've ironed the backside and flattened it back out again. Um, but this, what I'm going to do, especially because I mentioned it to Patrick and he seemed so enamored with the idea, is that we are going to attach some magnets. So I just have some little craft magnets that I picked up at the uh, craft store near me. Uh, they're little round disc magnets, uh, exact uh, 0.625 inch or 1.59 centimeter, I assume that seems like diameter. Um, I have in the past used strip magnets, which come like rolled up as a strip, but it's actually a pain to get them flattened back out and to get them on there. Uh, so we're going to attach these onto the back. Steggy is small enough that we can just directly attach these. We're going to have no problems at all, just like that. Um, if he was larger, for instance, uh, when I do one of my lightsaber name pieces, this one just says Custom Sabers, but others that I've done with names on them, whatever, I like to attach a little bit of extra to keep them uh, rigid because they wobble a lot. Uh, so I got just some... Uh, just from a hardware store, just some wooden 
uh, I, I, molding. Molding that looks good. It's mostly a flat bar, has a little bit of rounding on the top. It looks nice. Um, and so I've attached these to the back of Sabres, just cut down to whatever length I need. Uh, and if Stegi was bigger, was bigger, I would take a strip of this, put it onto there, just to give him that extra rigidity. But he's going to be fine with just this. So, get my stuff out of the way. We have Steggy. We have two magnets. I think he's going to do fine with two, just like that. One just behind his head, and one, yeah, centered around his rumpus a little bit. Kind of above the legs. Um, and we're going to attach that with E6000 craft glue. Um, we started out using hot glue, but, uh, you know, we had some of these named lightsabers, and they were up on the refrigerator, and they would fall. Um, craft glue doesn't stick nearly as well as E6000. Um, it is softer, it is more likely to break. It dries faster, but E6000 is going to make a much stronger bond. It's what I've been using for everything else since, and I've never had it fail. I'm holding it up, but that might actually be hot glue. I have had things still maybe like fall off of the fridge, but it's not because it unstuck from the magnet, it's because it was too heavy, which means it needs more magnets. Anyway, um, with this, I'm going to put, take my sheet of parchment paper, put that under Steggy, so that if the glue does seep through, it's gonna hit the parchment paper and it will be able to come off quite easily. If I just have it on the table, it's gonna get stuck to the table. We don't want that. Let's undo this here. A little bit of glue. And we'll put that right there. Mmm, it's got that nice strong model glue smell. And same thing with magnet number two. Cool. So E6000 e takes uh, a few minutes to dry and up to a day to fully cure. So why the heck not put some weight back on it and just let it sit. I mean, it doesn't necessarily need weight on it, but it doesn't hurt. I've got that balanced on the two magnets, and when we come back, Steggy will be complete. And now Steggy is done. Eee! We have glued the magnets onto the back with E6000, and it's gonna be nice and strong. With these magnets, you can attach it to, say, Patrick's locker. And there we go. It's set, it's ready. Um, now the magnets are not really going to come off of the beads, but it could still come off of the locker itself, which is, yeah. That fell, got a little hit, that was another uh, piece, and I just gotta clean that up. But all I have to do is to get this to Patrick, and uh, we have our finished pearly piece. I think he is super going to enjoy it. Neat. Thank you. Look at this beautiful gift <laughs> I received. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the uh, magnets, uh, although quite secure <laughs> on the pearly beads themselves, don't preclude from falling off of whatever. We might want a couple more magnets on that. I'll tell you how to get that set. Well, this is quality craftsmanship. I can tell you this much. It, he fell. Yeah, he yeah. He just fine. He this took is, a tumble and... Yeah, this yeah. is good stuff. Eee, right next to the original. So. Oh, it's so good. You even got the coloring. Oh, thank you. That's really cute. Thank you. Patrick enjoys it. Yay! And that has been a 35 minute video on how to create a pearler bead craft thing. <laughs> it was a little longer than I expected, but that's okay. If you want to see more pearler bead stuff, I live stream it sometimes over at twitch.tv slash boaterbug, and there will be a uh, card at the end of the video for time lapses of pearler beads that I've done. You can follow me at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.com slash boaterbug. Subscribe at right here at YouTube. <laughs> Support at Patreon and Ko-Fi.com slash Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a good one, and I will see you next time.